And then next after that, uh, I'm gonna go over um, what do you do with this basic uh, basic information that I'm gonna teach you today. How do you apply it in your clinic tomorrow? Okay. And then I will also do a little comparison of the traditional traditional. I I have a chart in there that I compiled together, comparing the traditional pulses and his pulses, and what are the similarities and what are the differences. You know. So then you can take a look at that. That will be helpful because as you start studying it and as you start to get into the terminology, uh, you will have a lot of questions, okay? And then after that, the second half or the last one third of the class is I'm going to go over his other methods of diagnosis like the blood pressure reading, I go over his auricular, his hand and his palm diagnosis. I'll go over some other teachers that I learned from too because since I thought I was when I was putting together the lecture notes, I thought, oh, might as well put down everything I know from the other teachers too, you know. Mm, it's not Dr. Chang's palm diagnosis, but it's also helpful, it's, you know, all in that general area of topic. So I put them all in there for you. And then a little bit of herbs at the end, you know, Dr. Chang's favorite formulas to use. So um, you, have a, um, you have an idea, a broad overview of how his treatment style is like and what he does in the clinic, okay? Okay, so who is Dr. Jimmy Chang? I'm sure everyone here probably knows about him. You know, he, he's been here more than 20 years and he's taught with the uh, E Lotus for about 20 years too. So at one point or the other, if you have been around that long since 20 years ago, you've heard of him and probably has, you know, have taken a class or two for, with him. But he, did you continue? You know, that's another story because he is a little bit of a difficult teacher to follow. So he is a genius, you know, he is self-taught. He never went to Chinese medicine school. He has um, some syphils that he learned from, you know, um, but he never went to school. He learned from the books himself. And then he took the Chinese medicine uh, exam in Taiwan, which is very hard to pass. I think the passing rate is maybe like only 5%. Um, so there are not a lot of acupuncturists, licensed TCM practitioners in Taiwan because it's so difficult. And he's not from any lineage. He discovered all these special pulses himself, you know, through going to the hospitals. And I remember him telling me about going to the hospitals. Each, each week he would be in a different department trying to feel all their pulses. So then he concluded with what he has taught us um, today from all his, his own experience, basically. So in the past, when he was uh, younger, before he came to America, he saw probably 100, sometimes 150 patients a day. And he, well, worked into the evening. You know, these guys, they, they see patients starting 5 o'clock in the morning before people go to work. And then they would have their afternoon break a bit. And then um, from 5 o'clock, they would start to see patients until about 10 o'clock in the evening. And he had, I think, four or five staff in the pharmacy working to mix the herbs together and another couple staff in the front desk. So all really he had to do was just feel the pulse, feel the pulse. So that's how he was able to see so many. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. So in 1997, he moved here and we met. And since he's been teaching 20 years ago, um, he's taught many people. I think some of you might have learned from his students, you know, like Bob Dong. Chris Valesky, Brad, Eileen, myself, you know, and a couple of other Spanish speaking speakers. So um, more and more people are getting to know this system, which I think it's very good for today's practice because the, one of the main, um, main key points of his system is that you're able to take the pulse and tell them their Western medicine diagnosis. You know, with the t traditional way of taking pulses, you're not able to. You can only tell in deficiency, qi deficiency, blood deficiency, right, heat or cold. And when you have these kind of TCM diagnosis and you're telling your patients this, it doesn't really m make much sense to them, you know. So if you can diagnose, oh, you have a gallstone, oh, you have mitral valve regurgitation, or oh, you have gas, you know, oh, you have a viral infection in your lungs, uh, that's a lot more convincing and you guys are speaking the same language. I find that very helpful, you know, both in diagnosis and also in gaining patient confidence. Okay, so if you want to know more about Dr. Chang, uh, Lotus did a three-part interview uh, with Ivy a long time ago. You know, we interview how he became a Chinese medicine doctor, um, you know, how did he start teaching and all that. So 
you know, the, the links are in your lecture notes. You can go on YouTube to watch because, um, you know, it's not easy. It's not easy to become a master. He put in a lot of hard work. So if you want to one day become like him, you also have to put in a lot of work. And thank goodness you, we spent so much time with him, you know, with many dinners and many <laughs> beer. You know, he was very happy. When he's happy, he tells us more, you know. That's how one of the ways to study with a Chinese master. Uh, but anyway, we we I put together all these different notes to help you understand because you know there is a big language barrier. Sometimes when he speaks in Chinese, it makes perfect sense, but when it when it's in English, it's a little more confusing, you know. Okay, so as far as questions, if you have questions, can you type them into the Q and A uh, uh, platform? And then when I have time towards the end of class, I will go and answer them. Okay. All right, so next slide. Now, next to Tuina, I think pulse diagnosis is probably the hardest to learn because these two skills involve you actually feeling what the master is feeling, right? Uh, what the herbs, learning herbs, learning acupuncture, learning other styles is a little bit easier. At least it's not as, um, how do I put this? Because, you know, with Tuina, if you are learning Tuina, if you're into that, you know when you're watching the teacher do the different movements, you, you sort of know what he's doing, but you don't really know because you're not the patient. You don't know how deep he's going, you know, what direction he's going, you know, how much force, et cetera, et cetera. That's all something that is very subjective. So that's why it's always good if you're in a class for Tuina or for pulse diagnosis, you become the demo patient. So to feel what the teacher is trying to feel, right? Like in, in pulse diagnosis, it's always good to be the, the, the demo patient. As he takes your pulse and he tells you what you have, you can take your own pulse and then see if what you feel matches what he feels. So that's why eventually, you know, on your journey to become a good master pulse technician or a diagnostician, you want to eventually, you know, go to his clinic. It's kind of, it's like kind of like a, um, like a, what do you call that? Pilgrimage to uh, Tibet or to the temples. You know, we pilgrimage ourselves to Dr. Chang's clinic when he's still practicing before he retires to take pulses right next to him, right after he sees the patient, so you can get the most accurate reading. Maybe you have already, you know, uh, studied this for a couple years and you've discovered some new pulses that are not in the notes that we know of. It's a great way to ask him too. Okay. So there are many different pulse taking systems. I remember I studied with this one teacher in um, in Taiwan, and he uses the Li Shizhen Ping Hu Mai Xue. You know that that school of pulse diagnosis is very very different from this one. So I think um, if you want to learn, maybe one system at a time is good. Otherwise, it gets to be confusing. Okay. So now let's go in a little bit deeper here. A traditional TCM pulses, oh, I looked over it, we have 29 pulses, but Dr. Chang has 68. That's a lot, right? So in, in the beginning, you think, oh my God, 68 pulses. It's kind of like the first time you met Master Tong and oh my God, his Master Tong points, you know, another 100, some whatever, 200 points you had to remember. And the system is different from the TCM, you know, system, something totally new. But don't worry, okay? When you're learning a new language, I mean, or when you're learning anything, uh, there's always a framework. Focus on understanding the big picture first, okay? Don't worry about the details. It's kind of, I put it here. If, you, if you're looking at the word beautiful, okay? There are 50 synonyms for it. You can be alluring, cute, exquisite, you know, like pretty, da 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 da. That's all beautiful. So what you need to remember is, okay, all that means beautiful, just basically not ugly, okay? So when you're learning pulses, same thing, okay? If it's a big pulse, it's an excess condition. Don't worry about the intricate details of how he calls that big pulse. That's for later. For now, just know, okay, that's big pulse, excess, okay? So same thing. So if you're learning pulse diagnosis, okay, if you're dealing with the, somebody with a fine, a weak, or thready, small pulse, Ah, uh, in the beginning, probably you can't feel very much, right? Just to make it even more co complicated for you, there's such a thing called a scatter pulse, which is blood stasis. So that is very similar to a fine pulse or a weak pulse or a deep pulse, small pulse. And then, you know, you just stress yourself out. Oh, what is it? I don't really know. 
But you just at least know the big picture. That is not a deficient. I mean, that is not an excess pulse. So that big picture you need to know. Okay, going to Canada from Los Angeles, you go north. Going to Mexico, you have to go south. Okay, get the big picture first. So that's what I'm trying to gonna do for you today. Get the big picture. Okay, don't stress out over the details. That is gonna come later. Refinement and all that. You are going to get it eventually. Okay. Next page. So I wrote a few things down that you can learn from Dr. Chang and few problems you can diagnose in the Chun Guan Si on the right side and on the left side. You cannot diagnose these using the TCM system. TCM system. So if you're able right now to take the pulse of a patient, now Los Angeles County has a lot of COVID cases again. So when you're in your clinic, you are able actually to tell taking the right tune pulse if it's a bacterial infection or a viral infection. So bacterial infection is going to be something that's floating, excess, forceful. And a viral infection is something that is deep. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a little bit uh, later on today. But just to let you know, that's something that you can discern from just the right tune alone. So this system is... Um, I think superb in this area where he has figured out and you know like uh, put in the the puzzle, you know solve the puzzle in terms of what this means in terms of Western medicine the specific pulse. So you take he can take a look at yourself these different disorders that can be diagnosed. Okay, so on the left side you can diagnose these problems. And most of the time when you're in his clinic. Um, you know, either as a patient or as an intern or in class, and he would diagnose you and tell you a lot of problems with you. Sometimes you'll feel like, oh gosh, I'm going to die. You know, I have so many problems. And so don't feel alone. That is uh, with every patient. There's always something wrong because in the 20 years I've been learning from him, one time I asked him, you know, Dr. Cheng, is there such a thing as a normal pulse? And then he just laughed. He goes, no, everybody has something, some problem. And then five minutes later, he said, <laughs> he said, maybe the monk in the deep mountains have no problem and have a normal, you know, has a normal pulse, but, you know, we, we don't get to go in there to take his pulse. <laughs> anyway, so there is no, not really anything uh, that is really normal because the, his conclusion of a normal pulse is not too small, not too big, not too thick, not too thin, not too forceful, not too weak. So at first when I, when he told me that answer, I was not very happy about that. Wow, that's not very normal. That's not telling me very much, you know. But I don't. But today I feel the same way. What we what you're looking for in a pulse is something that's you know pronounced, you know something that is unusual. Um, but if you feel enough, long, I mean, if you feel uh, many pulses, if you feel enough patience, then you will come to that conclusion too. Something that is not too excess too deficient, et cetera, et cetera. Kind of like, um, like striking a balance. If your pulse is right in the middle, then yeah, the person is somewhat healthy, you know? Okay, next slide. Okay, so like all geniuses, if you have learned from Dr. Chang, you know that he's not easy to understand sometimes and learn from. He has different terminologies, description for pulses, you know, he names his pulse like sea turtle and turtle and, um, you know, uh, sometimes convex roof. You know, he has all these terminologies. But pretty much, again, you know, when you get confused, just go back to the big picture. OK, remember the framework and the big picture. Uh, don't get too confused. And then sometimes he has the same pinning name for the different formulas that he invents, different ingredients for the same name. It's very confusing. But as long as uh, what what? I guess once you practice long enough, you kind of uh, won't be so much of a stickler about what exactly is it. It's kind of like when I was learning acupuncture in school. Okay, well, you know, this point, let's say, is two tune above the wrist crease. So we, Dr. Tan used to always joke about the, his German students saying that, ah, they want to know exactly, you know, is it two tune? Is it 2.1 tune? You know, exactly where it is it, you know? And years later, all the senior acupuncturists that we learn from, they will tell you there is no point. It's in that general area, and then you need to palpate yourself to find where's the point, because these points move depending on the time of day and also depending on the state of the patient. 
So it is not 2.1 tun, 2.2 tun, 2.1, whatever, you know. And with the herb, same thing, you know. Sometimes he calls the herb formula, herbal formula the same name, but he has different ingredients. But if you carefully examine the formula ingredients, you will find the idea is the same. You know, he's either trying to achieve the anti-inflammatory effect or, you know, he's trying to move blood or whatever. He just uses different herbs. And he would sometimes tell you when I ask him a question, it's up to my inspiration, you know. Oh, I hate that when he says that because there's no guideline for us students to know what is your inspiration, right? I mean, how do you come to that? But that's just him. He's just like that. So, you know, when he's happy, I ask more questions. When he's not very happy, you know, I leave him alone, <laughs> basically. That's Dr. Chang. He's, uh, he's totally an artist. So um, eh, learning from him can be a challenge. Um, but, you know, one good thing about him that I like a lot is that he um, doesn't hold back his knowledge. A lot of Chinese doctors that I have studied with, some of them, oh, it's like pulling teeth to ask one question, you know, take half a year for them to answer one question. And then the answer to that one question, you could find in the textbook too. So those teachers, then I don't really study with them, you know, because that's even harder than learning from Dr. Chang. And they're not necessarily better, you know. Well, I should say, I shouldn't say better. They just, they know different, you know, they have different specialties, let's put it that way. But then if they're that difficult to learn with, you know, I don't feel like I have that much time to to be in their clinic and to to sweep the floor, you know, or to do whatever, be errand boy or girl, you know, because that's how it is to learn from a Chinese master. You have to do a lot of wax on, wax off, polish the car type of things, favors for the teacher, for them to take you. I mean, that's understandable. I mean, if if you, you know, think think if you were one day, you know, you have 40 years of experience and you're this great master in, in whatever technique you are, you have. You don't want to take every student, right? Any and every student. Some patients, I mean, some students might ask very basic questions. Like uh, the other day I had a customer call and asked me, oh, my patient is bleeding in the underwear. What formula should I use? So I thought, oh, wow, this must be a student asking a question like this, right? Bleeding from the underwear, nothing else, no other information. Or somebody who would ask, How, what herbs do you take for stomach ache? You know, well, you know what I mean? So I had another teacher who told me, um, Dr. Pong, who specialized in cancer. You know, I went to intern with him for three days, and he said, if you're serious about learning with me, I want you to finish reading these five classic books before you come back. I took a look at the five classic books he wanted me to read, and I thought, oh, there's no way I can do that, you know, because each of those books are like like this thick, and they're all in classical Chinese, and it's very difficult. And I thought, oh, okay, I better learn from somebody else because he, he would look at me sometimes when I ask him. I, I, I remember, this is off topic, but it's interesting because I asked him about IVF babies one time. I asked him, so are IVF babies the same as regular babies? And then he looked at me, he said, ah, oh, of course not, what a stupid question you're asking, you know? How can it be the same? And he just didn't answer. So, you know, every Chinese teacher is different, but um, Dr. Chang's system, we have it pretty much all figured out. So today I'm gonna give you a good overview, okay? I'm gonna make it very simple for you guys. And this is an intro class, okay? Uh, if you have any specific questions, you can find it in his different classes. I'm going to give you resources of where to go, where to find this information. Okay, so today's class is pretty much just 10 to 20% of his knowledge. All right? Okay, next. So before we start, I want you to forget what you know from school, if that's even possible. Especially, I mean, talk, I'm talking about just the pulses, okay? Don't delete what you know about slippery pulse, weak pulse, thin pulse, you know, and all that. And then I'll give you a foundation of uh, how Dr. Chang's system is. And then so you can go from there yourself. You can come back and compare to the traditional system if you like and see what kind of differences there are. But in the beginning, it's better to just not confuse the two systems. It's a, it's a little bit different. Okay. Next. All right, so let's go into the basics of the positions, okay? This this is something that you should, if you don't know it already, you should know. I mean, the right chun guan ci and the left chun guan ci are these respective organs. 
Now, I think、uh, traditionally we also say that the right side is the you know, especially the kidney position is kidney yang, and the left side is kidney yin. But in Dr. Chang's system, the right side is the urinary function, and the left side is the reproductive function. Okay, so if you're gonna detect a infertility patient, what is going on? You need to go to the left side, not the right side. Okay, that and then everything else is pretty similar. You have the right sun, you have the lung and large intestine. The guan position is the spleen and stomach, right? And the ci is the kidney, the urinary kidney. And then on the left side, you have the heart and small intestine, and then the liver and gallbladder, and then the kidney, the reproductive system on the ci position. So I think this is pretty easy. Everybody knows this. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, I'm gonna show you this. Sam got this really cool gadget. Is it on? Oh, okay. Let me switch the camera. I'll show you. So the finger position. Okay, traditionally, when we're taking pulses, the styloid process is is where you put the guan position, right? You find your styloid process and you put your middle finger over it. That's the guan. But for Dr. Chang's system, you have to shift your finger slightly. Down a bit because that styloid process is the separation point between the tun and the guan. So this is very important because he's always said that if you don't get the position right, you won't make the right diagnosis, which is true. It's kind of like playing piano, right? You if you don't get the keys right, your music is gonna be off a bit. Okay, so I want you guys all to take a look at your own hand now. Mark your own styloid process. That is the highest point. So let me show you on my hand here. Okay. So, so on my can you guys see? So on my hand is pretty prominent.、Uh, that is the styloid process, right? Highest point. So, put a little mark there. So when I'm taking my own pulse, take a, put a bigger mark. So I'm taking my own pulse. Oh shoot! This is kind of awkward. It's kind of like,、uh, yeah. So you get the idea, right? So tun and guan and tun. Oh, here you got it. Everybody got it. So styloid process, okay? These are the positions I went over already. And then, okay. So one one more thing is when you're taking the pulse, you want to take it from the outside. So you you see the incorrect picture is you're going over the tendon. So then, that is not recommended by Doctor Chang because what he's feeling is he's feeling the entire vessel, blood vessel. So you gotta be able to roll your fingers when you are crossing the tendons. Your 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 hand is flat on the patient's right. Patient's forearm, and then you cannot feel the 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 pulse as easily. The entire shape of the pulse. So always come in from this angle, all right, from the outside. And then index finger is always the tun position. Okay, you never taking pulse like this, with the index finger on the tun. It's always this way. Okay. Next is put your thumb on the sanjiao four, so there's space to maneuver. So, okay, let me turn the camera again. Okay. So you're not taking the pulse like this because this dead space here will not allow you to maneuver the finger easily, right? So if your thumb is on Sanjiao Four, you have you can fit an egg right here. That means then you can easily maneuver, right? You can use your fingertip if you have to use the bed of the nail. Or this way, or you can move around easier. You can move around like this, and you can feel the entire vessel, right? But if it's not like this, it's like this. It's hard to move, right? You can try it on yourself. Okay, so the index finger is in front of the styloid, in front of the styloid process. So it's the first one, and then the middle finger, and then the last finger. And when you're taking pulses of the patient, you want to also remember 
the size of the patient relative to your size. So if I'm taking a pulse of a guy who is 6'5", I had to spread my fingers out a little bit more, right? Because he's so so much taller. But if I'm taking a patient who is like four feet eight, something like that, then I have to squeeze it in tighter because, you know, relatively speaking, they're smaller. So their cun guan zi will be smaller, the distance. Okay, next. All right, the patient's palm should be facing the side, not the ceiling. So I have a picture there for you. I don't know why, but I think it's just easier for you to take the pulse this way. Easier to feel the entire vessel. Okay, and then next, you, you want to start gentle. This is something that I did as a mistake when I was first learning from him. I remember, oh, he would tell me to feel something. I would go in and grab it really deep, you know. So if you're feeling your own pulse and then if you're seeing your finger turning wide and you're pressing too hard, you want to always just lay your fingers on the pulse and on the skin and then just feel if you can feel anything on the skin level gently first. Because a lot of times towards the end when I was learning from him, I, I felt like a lot of pulses that he felt, it's something, how do you say this? Something that you pick up on your first try. So when you first put the hands on the thing, uh, put your fingers on the patient's pulse, whatever first feeling that you get, that's the answer. Many times if you keep trying to go in and feel whatever it is and, and then you get confused, you know, oh, I thought it was weak at first, but then how come it feels strong? You, you will get this feeling. But which one is right, you know? Uh, did I do it wrong in the beginning or what? Um, one or two things. One is probably because your position was wrong, so that's why you're feeling weak and sometimes strong the next time you feel it. And two is because you're too nervous and you're just trying too hard to figure it out. It's um, very difficult in that sense because then um, you're not really picking up what the patient is exhibiting rather than you... you, you I guess, how do you put this? Like your energy is all in your brains more in, uh, than on your fingers trying to feel. You're trying to logic, trying to logic it out, what, what you're feeling. So in that case, it's really hard to feel the pulse. Okay. So in the beginning, just put your hand gently there and see if you feel anything and then go slightly in. And always, you know, Dr. Chen always says, if you don't feel it, take your hands off, come back again because, you know, patient's heartbeat is going on and then you can try again and see how you feel but then you might encounter what I just told you you feel something totally different than what you felt at first and that's normal okay okay next one okay so he says take the pulse with the bed of the fingers don't take it with the tip of the fingers and that is just basically to have more surface area so they can feel the entire vessel of the patient okay Okay, so that is pretty much the basics of taking pulses where your finger should be. And um, if you look through your lecture notes, I put down this important, right? On the top right hand corner right here. If you see an important next to a slide, that means that slide is important. When you go back to review the notes, you want to review those slides. Those are more important than the other ones mm, because it gives you the overall big picture and the big framework. Okay, so really when it comes down to it with Dr. Chang's system is you just have to figure these three things out. One is the jump, one is the shape, and one is the level. Just these three things. And if you want to narrow it down even more, it's really just the jump and the shape because the level is significant in some cases, but not in others, in some positions, not in other positions. So now let's spend a little bit of time on the jump, okay? Oops, go back. So jump pretty much is the pulsation aspect of what makes up a pulse. It's very much just the strength. So we're dealing with either strong or weak. That's it. So get it into your brain that is really just a strong pulse or weak pulse. You figure that out, then you can figure out if the patient is more on the strong side or on the weak side, or you know, too much fire or deficiency. Okay, so that's the one big picture, strong or weak. That's the jump. Two is the shape. 
So you want to figure out what the structural aspect of what makes up that pulse. Is it a straight pulse? Is it a convex pulse? Is it a concave pulse? Okay, so what is that? What does that mean? So what is a straight pulse? That is pretty straightforward, right? A straight pulse is just like a straight pulse. And a convex pulse is something that you can feel like a bulge. I'll show you a picture later. Concave pulse is when you put your finger on the pulse, it just feels like, ooh, nothing's there, it sinks in. Kind of like somebody's fat belly. Put your finger there, it sinks in, kind of like that. Nothing down there to hold it. You know, there's no vessel, no shape, nothing. It's like a concave. But it really is the efficiency of that pulse. But you can still feel the border a bit. That is uh, descriptive. You might not feel that in the clinic, but if you feel like uh, a concave pulse, he specifically talks about this concave pulse more in the left guan than any other position. So if you see like a weak pulse in the left guan, you can pretty much go towards a concave pulse, you know, and come to the conclusion of concave pulse. Okay, so this is what makes up a pulse, the strength, the shape, and also the level. The level is at the depth of which the pulse is felt, okay? Sometimes it's in the superficial level, sometimes in the mid-level, sometimes it's in the deep level. Every pulse has its own normal level that it should be in, and if it's not in its own normal level, it's disease, something is wrong. So that is something that you can learn more of as we get into each position, okay? But if you don't, if you take away that level and then just focus on the jump and the shape, you'll be fine. By the end of today, if you just get these two ideas, then you're good. Okay. So next. So here I further broke it down for you. Okay, the jump is defined as the force of the pulse rebounding on your finger. So you want to determine the following now. If you have a super forceful pulse, then you know you have a lot of excess heat or you have fire. If it's just forceful, then it's heat. If it's normal, you know, like all three positions feel pretty much the same. There's not one pulse that is higher than the other and it looks pretty congruent with the patient. Then that's pretty normal. You know, it's not too, too strong, not too weak, you know. And if it feels weak, there's deficiency. And if you don't feel anything there, then ah, that patient is very deficient. Okay, this is the general guideline. There are some exceptions. There are some pulses, like I was telling you earlier about the scatter pulse, right? Scatter pulse, um, that is not deficiency, that is blood stasis. Feels very similar to this, but then that's something for you to feel and figure out yourself later. So pretty much that's the jump. Okay, the shape of the vessel. Now, you can further divide this into uh, these four categories, okay? So what you wanna feel for each position is if the pulse is thick or thin, and if it's straight or if it's con or curved, let's put it that way, you know, concave or convex, they're curved pulses, and straight pulse is just a straight pulse, and they have different definitions. So just to give you an over, overview of the difference between straight and curved pulses, you can write this down on your notes. Straight just means there's a lot of fire, usually, or a lot of coldness. It hasn't changed the structure of the body or the structure of the body, the anatomy is still okay. So that's why the vessel is still straight. However, if you're feeling the convex pulse, that means something is swollen in the body. Either the, uh, the, the soft tissue is swollen, you know, um, or you have some sort of nodule growth, or you have some sort of cyst growth, or you have some mass or tumor or whatever it is that is presenting in the pulses. So in that position, if you feel a bump or something convex, you know, something is growing in that area or something is swollen in that area, like a hernia, you know, many times you'll feel that in between pulses, in between cun or guan, guan or ci, in the middle, you know, you can feel it, it feels like a little bump. Those are usually hernias. And if you feel uh, like a, like a bump in other, like a bump in the right cun, you know, that might be some sort of, um, some sort of polyp or some sort of colitis or some sort of something swollen in the large intestine, 
Okay, we will go over uh, that. You can take a look at the chart that I put together for you later. But in essence, just remember this, okay? It's either thick and straight, thin or straight, thick and convex, or thick and curved, or thin or cur curved. So there's no other type of possibility. It's These are the possible shapes, okay? Other shapes that are more complicated, uh, we won't discuss, you know, like the ones, like the step pulse or like the scatter pulse, we won't talk about it here. But the big picture is this, most of the pulses will fall into these four categories. Okay, next one. Okay, so now if you think about it, if thickness means expansion, can you type in the chat room and let me know what you think would cause the vessel to expand? What do you think? Out of the, you know, the six evils that we know, what do we have? We have wind, cold, heat, dampness, dryness, and summer heat, right? What could cause the vessel to expand? Heat, heat, damp, heat, damp, heat, heat, damp, heat. Damp, damp. Yeah, very good. But if you have to just pick one, would it be damp or heat, you think? Which one could cause more expansion? Damp, heat, 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 damp, heat. Yeah, the answer is heat. It's kind of like uh, when you get angry, your vessel expands, you know. Dampness, I see your logic. Some of you put down dampness. It's probably because you're thinking the dampness causes blockage, right? And it makes the vessel expand. Um, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't do that. The pulse for dampness in his system is a deep pulse. Every fat person, fat patient or obese patient or somebody with a lot of water retention all have a deep pulse. They will not show a superficial thick pulse that is easily palpable, okay? Now, next, constriction. What makes the pulse constrict, you think? Let me read you again the six evils. We have wind, cold, heat, damp, dryness, and summer heat. Oh, very good. Cold. Yeah, oh my god, you guys are all gonna do so good. Took me years to learn this stuff. Maybe you'll, you'll get it in half a year. Congratulations. Yeah, it, it, it's just easy, right? If you think about it, if you have a, if you have a, <laughs> a pulse that is constricting and thick, like a guitar string, you know, very wiry, very thin, you, you're dealing with constriction. And what causes that constriction? Right? Ah, cold is the first one that you can think of. And then probably the next, next one is liver cheese stagnation, right? That causes constriction. But pretty much heat and cold, you, when you're in the hot weather, your vessel expands like global warming right now. Los Angeles is so hot. And then, yeah, thin pulse, you know, in somewhere where it's snowing, your vessels constrict. So that's exactly what it is. If you're dealing with a thick pulse, you just think towards heat. If you're dealing with a thin pulse, think towards cold then you're in the general right direction, okay? And then from there on, you wanna figure out, uh, next is what is the jump, right? Because we have figured out the shape. Now let's go to the next picture here. All right, take a look at this. Hey, don't jump ahead, deficient blood later, okay? Well, let's look at the big picture first, going north, going to Canada first. Now, you're dealing with, if you're dealing with a thick and forceful pulse, which he calls a big pulse, does, is it clear to everyone that it's an excess heat condition? This is not a deficient heat, right? It's a totally big picture of an excess heat patient. It's thick and it's forceful, right? Thick is the shape, forceful is the jump. So for every pulse, every patient, every position, you want to always go back to yourself and think, what is the shape, what is the jump? And then if you want to, figure out the level, okay? So Dr. Dr. Um, Dr. Tan has the acupuncture one, two, three, remember? In the very beginning when he was teaching, you know, after dinner, we were talking about it and I suggested to him, I can't even remember it was me or John, you know, why don't you do acupuncture one, two, three, make it simple, three steps. And then in pulse diagnosis, you can do the same too. It's pulse diagnosis one, two, three. One is figure out the shape. One is figure out the jump. And then the last figure out the level. So if you go back to this, Every time, you will not get confused. Later on, you're gonna have confusing questions, but if you can always come back to this, you won't be confused, okay? I'll tell you why when we finish this section. 
Now next we have thin and weak, which is what he calls a small pulse, right? So does that everyone understand that's a deficiency? Yeah? Oh sorry, I should have made this the thin plus forceful should be a different line. Let's see if I can correct this here. Like that. Yeah. Okay, so so Sam, how do I share this screen again? Just Oh, do this? Tap, tap. tap. I, I took it took it off. Okay, so does it does that make sense to everybody? The thin and weak equals deficiency, right? When the shape is small, the pulse is low, then that's just deficiency. No question. There's no excess picture here at all. I think that should be pretty self-explanatory, these the first two at least, right? Now the next one. Thin and forceful. Have you ever encountered that kind of pulse? It feels very tight, like a guitar string. So if it's thin, that means there's some sort of constriction. And if it's forceful, that means there's coldness. Okay, that's what that means. And this is especially true if you find it in the left twin position. If you find this pulse in the left twin position, you know that the heart has coldness. And heart is the organ of the fire, right? And in the fire element, the worst thing you can do is to have cold in there. So these are the people who have angina. So if you feel that kind of pulse, you would ask them, oh, do you have chest pain? You know, you might have angina, pectoris, if you feel this, this pulse. And then the last one, thick plus weak. That's what Dr. Chen calls a scatter pulse. And scatter pulse means stagnation or specifically, more specifically, blood stagnation. So this is a pulse that is harder for beginners because it's hard to distinguish this from just a thin pulse or just a weak pulse or just a deep pulse. So my suggestion for this is when you feel the pulse and you feel like, oh, it feels kind of deep. I cannot really feel anything. I don't know what this is. Okay, then maybe it's scattered, but maybe not, okay? And you would double check to see if scatter. Scatter means blood stagnation, right? So this patient is also going to have other blood stasis signs. Very obvious when they're sitting there. Just look at their lips if it looks kind of purplish, right? And then you look at the arms if it kind of looks dark in the crease. And then you look at their tongue if it looks purplish, then you know, yeah. Whatever pulse you are feeling, it's not just thin or weak. It's a scatter pulse. So that will help you to determine what is a scatter pulse because... That pulse, I think it's hard for people to feel in the beginning. And thank goodness we can, you know, ask questions and look at other signs, right? Not just purely rely on pulse diagnosis. So these are the four big summaries of what pulses um, you should be look for, looking for. Every pulse almost could be categorized into these four categories. So as long as when you're taking the pulse tomorrow, remember the pulse diagnosis one, two, three, what is the shape? Is it thick or thin? Is it curved or straight? And then next, number two, what is the jump? Is it strong or weak? Um, then you can figure out uh, the big picture, which, which of these four categories does the pa patient belong to? Okay? Now, let's go to the next one. Okay. Now I'm going to come back to these questions later after we finish talking about it. Let's jump, go to page six of your handout, okay? Oh, wait, no, sorry. My handout is different than yours. I printed six pages, I mean, six slides to a page. So I don't know what page this is, but just keep going. Skip the questions. Let's come back to them later. Let's talk about the shapes first. I want you to understand the difference between the thick and thin and strong and weak first before we go to the questions. Now. Here's a good example, right? If you're looking at, look at, look at this. Look at how the vessel can bulge like this. So if it's bulging in an aneurysm like this somewhere in your body, it's also reflecting in your pulse too. That's exactly what it feels like in your, in your pulse. So if you are dealing with that, if you feel that, why don't you guys feel your own pulse while, we're, you know, lis while you're listening to me? I mean, is there anywhere, I mean, do you feel your pulse to be straight? Is it curved? You know, is it bulging like this at a position? 
or in between positions. If you feel that, that means there's some sort of swelling, you know,、mm, right? Your structure, either you have inflammation and swelling, or you have some sort of mass growing, obstruction, or stagnation. Okay. If you want to know the specific definitions or specific terminologies of、uh, the different types of bulging pulses, you can go to his pulse synergy part two class. He has three classes. Uh, those are the three classes that gives you the basics of all his pulse diagnosis. Today's class is kind of like a summary of these three classes. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so can you see the three D view? This one, you know, the the pulse is is convex, and when you're looking at the convex pulse, this is a shape, right? Con whoops, convex pulse is a shape. So if you're dealing when you're feeling the jump of the pulse, if it feels forceful, that means the condition is more acute. There's more inflammation, there's more blockage, and there's more pain. So it's an acute state. You have to help them with that. You know, reducing that bulging pulse or that convex pulse, so they'll they'll feel better. And then next is if that bulge. Okay, now feel your own pulse. If you feel a bulge, press down on it. If it if it feels soft, that means it goes away when you push deeper. Then that means it's usually a temporary condition. It's not very severe. Perhaps it's just gas or chi stagnation. Okay, nothing to be more concerned about. It will most likely go away itself if your diet and lifestyle, you know, is、um, changed. But if you're Feeling something that is hard, meaning you push down on it and it is still there, and you cannot push it away. Okay, then that's when you should be a little bit more concerned because that means there is something solid. Okay, so he calls it like the bean pulse, the turtle pulse, rainbow pulse, all that. It's just all convex pulses, and the reason he calls it that is because he's an artist, you know. He's trying to find a terminology that best correlates to that pulse because some <laughs> some convex pulses are bigger than others, so he has to give it a different name. And later, I'll give you a picture that sums up all of them and then the sizes. I remember the the day when we were trying to figure out like what size is exactly a bean pulse. You know, like he would say, "Oh, you find a bean pulse in between the two pulses." But what size is a bean pulse? What size is a rainbow pulse? You know. That was a very interesting conversation. He had to finally give us some definite answer for reference, and that will be in the chart that's coming up that I'll share with you in a bit. Okay, so all of these, it just pretty much means there's something growing or something swollen in the body, and the harder it is, the harder the pulse. The softer it is, the softer the pulse, and the less severe. Okay, so this shape. Is the shape of each position. Okay, we're not talking about the entire Cun Guan Si, the shape of the vessel. We're talking about the shape of the vessel in each position, or in between positions. Okay.、Mm, anything else I want to talk about here? Okay. No. Next. Concave pulses. Okay. These are the pulses that dips down. Okay. Uh, he he did that picture before. Uh, it he okay on top here you see the three springs right. He always would describe like the pulses feel like you know you're playing the trumpet and the trumpet has springs underneath. So that rebound pressure, what you're feeling is the strength of the spring right, which is the jump or the force. So it, the 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 concave pulse feels like the spring is broken. That's what that feels like. So if you're feeling your pulse, and then you find some the pulse in the deep level, and you're not sure if it's a deep pulse or a weak pulse or a thin pulse,、uh, it could likely be a concave pulse. And just remember that concave pulses are usually found on the right or left guan positions. So you're not likely to find a concave pulse in the chun or the ci position. In the chun or the ci position, he just calls it a weak pulse or small pulse. Small pulse is a thin and and weak pulse. Thin is the shape, weak is the jump. 
So only when it's in the Guan position, he calls it a concave. So I guess technically you could also say that's just the weak pulse. Okay. All right. So uh, there are a lot of meanings that we will go over what that means, the concave pulse. But in general, it's more deficient than excess, right? Because it sinks in and it's deep and it's uh, weak. So that... I hope makes sense to all of you. So whatever is bulged up is more excess. Whatever is concave is more deficiency. Okay, level. Now, level is the level in which you feel the pulse. So generally speaking, superficial pulse is more of an exterior condition and deep pulse is more of an interior or chronic condition, generally speaking, okay? But superficial pulse does not always mean exterior invasion. We learned that in school. I learned that in school. Oh, superficial pulse means, you know, you catch a wind cold or a wind heat. But when I asked Dr. Cheng that, he says, no, that doesn't necessarily have to be true. Because if you take the pulse of a patient with hypertension or hyperthyroidism or somebody with excess heat, you can still feel their pulse on the superficial level, right? That doesn't mean that they have wind cold or wind heat. Ah, oh, that got me thinking. Hmm. So my conclusion of that was superficial pulse or the pulse when you can feel it, right? When you put your finger on it, if it's on the right tune, which is the lung position, then more likely that you're dealing with a respiratory infection, wind heat or wind cold. Any other position doesn't necessarily mean that there is. But... I suppose the answer is very easy because when they have a cold, you can tell, right? They're either coughing, have a sore throat, or they look like they have a cold or flu. So then you, you don't really need, even need to know superficial pulse or not. So anyway, so going with the level, I didn't put this down. So will you write this down on your notes? That generally speaking, tun guan zi, the level should be, tun should be more superficial Guan should be mid-level, and Ci should be a little more on the deep level. So if you're finding the Cun position in the very deep level, something's wrong. Or if you're finding the Ci position in the superficial level, something's wrong. Okay, They should be in their home position. That's what we call a normal pulse in their respective home position. Cun is always more superficial, Guan is mid-level, and Ci is deep level. And that has to do with the anatomy of the hand, too. If you look at the anatomy, you know, the tun position is just higher, right? So naturally, it's like that. All right. Okay, next is, in terms of level, I just want to let you know that superficial equals dryness. So that you can... To help you remember that, you can remember that when you have dryness, you usually have heat. Right? It's very not very often that dryness comes with cold. So when dryness has heat, then the pulse will be more superficial because there's heat involved. And dampness is like water, right? Water, you can go down deep in the ocean. So you can remember that deepness, deep pulse equals dampness. So if you're dealing so with this, let me ask you a question. Now, if it's damp heat, what are you feeling? What type of pulse could it be? Damp heat. So damp, you're dealing with deep, right? Heat, what pulse is heat? Can you type in the chat room for me? Damp heat is deep and what? Is it deep and forceful or deep and weak? Yeah, good. Yeah, pretty much deep and forceful. Hey, the person who says slippery, Evan, you still haven't forgotten what you learned from school, huh? Slippery is dampness back in school, but not here. Slippery means mental disorders in Dr. Cheng's um, pulse energy. Sorry, I didn't mean to call you out, but I was just thinking. Uh, that's what I thought, too, in the very beginning. Slippery pulse, slippery pulse, like rolling pearls. But <laughs> okay, it's just a different definition, different terminology. All right, next one, not superficial. Okay, if you're dealing with dry heat, what's the pulse? Somebody with a skin disease. Dry heat is your uh, is your diagnosis. What's the pulse? Superficial and what? Hmm. 
yeah, superficial and forceful. So it's pretty much like that. Very easy. Just figure out the shape, the jump, and the level, and you got like 50% of it down, okay? Let me go over this with you. Took a long, long time to go to to produce this chart. So, so now if you look at the shape, straight wiry pulses. The comparison of the diameter of the straight pulses. Okay, so let me see if I can have a annotate mouse. Okay, can you see my mouse moving on the screen? Yes? Or no? Yes, the mouse? Okay. So if you look at the, the chart here, let me just tell you how we device this out, okay? So on the left, we, this is when we asked Dr. Chang, how small is a small pulse you know, or, or a roof? How, how thin is a... Basically, we want to know the size because when you're taking the pulse, you have no idea when he's throwing five or six different pulses at you, right? So blade here is the thinnest of all straight pulses. So that is approximately 0, 0.1 millimeters. Okay, we, we, we were really very German when we were asking him this. So give us an exact size. But relatively speaking, okay, we were just trying to give him to get him to tell us in comparison of all the straight pulses, which one or the wiry pulses, which one is the thinnest, you know, the gradient thinnest to the thickest. So here you go. Blade is the thinnest. Roof is the second. And then Ren, your know, Inchao pulse, which is also known as a guitar string or steel wire pulse. So if you're dealing with a wiry pulse, when you feel a wiry pulse, it's right around here, 1.25 millimeters, about a Ren, or it's also called a Ren or Inchao pulse. That is a guitar string or a wiry pulse. Normal pulse is about 2.5 millimeters. And then here on the right side of the spectrum, you have the thick pulses. You have the Tong pulse or the Du pulse or the Tai Yang pulse. And here, five millimeter, big Sao Yang pulse. So don't worry about all these terminology for now, okay? You just focus on knowing that the thick and thin pulses could range from 0 0.1 millimeter all the way to five millimeter. So the thicker it is, the more heat usually, and the thinner it is, the more cold. Just remember that. Later, as you study more, you can go into, okay, well, how, how, how thick is exactly a blade pulse or a roof pulse? And one thing is very encouraging is um, it's great that we have body memories, you know, because when you, when you feel a pulse, once you feel a pulse and you know what that pulse is, your body will not forget. Next time you feel it, it will remember for you. You don't have to remember it cerebrally. You know, the body will know, ah, that's, that's this, that's that. So that's a great thing about body memory. So, but then before you can have that, you need to know, like, you know, on the spectrum of thick and thin, where those are and what they mean. Okay. So then now, <clears throat> going down here, thin and straight pulses from one tautest to five least taut. So tightest to, I guess, loosest, if you will. So here we wrote it down, you know, blade is about 0 0.1 millimeters and it's, the tightness is one. And then all the way coming down to here, right? To the very bottom, the brachial pulse. The brachial pulse is this one down here. That is greater than five millimeter and the tautest is, the, the tightness sensation is a six. Thickest. So this is the thickest, and this is the thinnest. The blade pulse is the thinnest. Brachial pulse is the thickest. Brachial pulse is only found here. The blade pulse is something he talks about only for the left guan. And if you find a very thin, very tight, almost like a blade cutting your hand, that is a very dangerous pulse for the liver. It just pretty much means the liver cirrhosis or the liver is going to fail. You know, it's, it's a very dangerous pulse. And I think um, that's the case for probably all the organs, but the ones I remember are this one for the left guan and then the left tun, right? The pulse within a pulse, which is like a very tight guitar string pulse on the right tun, which means there's coldness, extreme coldness in the heart. 
And extreme coldness in the heart is just equals angina. This is also bad news for the organ. So anytime you have such a thin and tight pulse, that means something in the, the, the vessels in the organs are constricting so much that it's probably not pushing enough blood into the organs, so the organ is going to fail, you know. So that's what that means. The blade pulse, the roof pulse. Roof pulse is also the same. It's also the same thing. The roof is, he's talking about, he's not talking about the flat roof, okay? He's talking about the roof that's like this, and on the top, it's very sharp, you know, this area of the roof. So... Roof is kind of like blade, but it's not as sharp as the blade, not as thin as the blade, and not as tight as the blade. So these are all just, uh, it gives you an idea of the tightness and also the thickness. Now looking over here to the middle section, now here is chun. Okay, let me, let me write this down. So this is chun. This is the chun position. And this is the, this is the guan position. This is the ci position. So in his intake form, you'll always see something here and here because you have the chun guan ci position, right? The one, two, three positions. And then what is in front here, he is noting the eight extra meridians. So if you feel, feel any pulses distal to the first position, he will draw it on his intake form over here. I'll show you his intake form in a bit. And if he feels pulses proximal to the ci position, he'll draw it over here on the intake form. So in his intake form, Dr. Chang doesn't write down any words. It's just all drawing and circling of stuff. And I'll show you that in a bit. But that's why, um, in, that's why we drew the positions like this. Let me erase this you know, so you can see it more clearly. So do you understand that um, this is chun guan ci, one, two, three? Yeah, yes? Can you put yes down for, for me in your chat room? Okay, good. So now next is uh, this. Okay. Do you see that we drew we drew this um we drew these uh like you know this line and it says roof, right? And then this line it says blade. Oh the E is missing, the blade. Uh so that means these two these two pulses only you can find, you will find on the guan position. Okay, guitar string, in chow pulse, rem pulse, right? See, guitar string is only in the ci position. In chow is something that you will see on the ci position as well as extending proximally to the ci position. There are pulses here, you know, pulses here beyond the ci position. If you feel your own, you can feel sometimes it, sometimes it extends to half of your forearm that far out. That's possible. And those are the people with a lot of neck pain and back pain. And then here, the red pulse is something that you find like here. See how see how deep it is? The level. Okay. The color indicates the different pulses. The length of the vessel that we drew out indicates the position. And also the depth where the, where the line is indicates the um, the level of where the pulse is found. So the red pulse is something that is very close to the bone, pretty much a deep, deep pulse. Okay, so is that clear on how you read this uh, read this chart here? Okay, so same thing here. The straight, thick pulses. You know, you have the big pulse that's usually in the guan position. And then the Sao Yang pulse is here, Tai Yang pulse is the Ci, and then also beyond the Tong pulse, the Du pulse, and the brachial pulse, where the elbow is, we put down here at the very end. So this gives you a good overview of where the pulses are and how tight they are, you know, and also how thick they are. So that's this, this chart on the thickness. Next page. All right, so fatty liver. Okay, how do you tell fatty liver? You just look at the, the fingers. The, <laughs> Sam is looking at his finger. Do you have it? <laughs> all right, so, so, you know, if all these fingers look fatter than the joints, I mean, you know, it looks pretty meaty, right? That is fatty liver. Yeah, you guys, you have that? It's pretty easy to tell. 
So pretty much the width of the 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 finger is wider than the joint. Then you have fatty liver. Let's go to the next page. Huh? Clear. Okay. So here, the dark crease lines they indicate high cholesterol. This is pretty accurate too. So uh, Dr. Chang does this. He looks at the he looks at the hand um, before he takes a pulse. So when he sees like this dark line, dark line, you know, he'll say, "Oh, high cholesterol." Okay. The narrow thumb is weak digestive system. All right, next. Okay, this is another picture of chubby fingers indicating fatty liver. Chubby fingers and dark line. So this guy has both fatty liver and high cholesterol. Okay, and next, this is also dark. So the, the, um, the shade of the line, how dark it is, indicates how bad the cholesterol level is. Okay, this is another example. This one is more deficient because the overall look is more pale, right? But there are red spots. So again, another picture of the toxicity in the liver and the heart. Usually, if uh, I, if you see the whole hand is all red, it's it's just invading the liver. But if it's just this area, then it's more the heart. Okay, this is another one. So many, many, many pictures. This one. This one was born with uh, hepatitis. I think she got it from her mom. So her whole hand is all, all red. And then this one, Dr. Chang says, if you see this right here, just right here, right? That means it's um, sugar metabolism problem. So maybe the patient will have diabetes. So if you see this, then you want to check the right guan position for a deep, forceful, and wiry pulse. That's sugar and diabetes. Okay, only at the ulnar side of the palm. So it's not the entire side is red. It's just at the at the base. Sugar. Okay, and here the wrinkles in front of the ear they mean poor sleep. So when you're looking at the ears and you see these features, you can just tell your patient you have this, you have this, you have that. And then Dr. Chen will mark them all on the intake form. You know, you remember he has two ears on the intake form. He'll just draw them on. Here, kidney stone. All right, so kidney stone looks like this. These black, like blackheads here, that indicates kidney stone. So this is the, this area is the kidney area. So blackheads here means kidney stone. 